me know when you're ready, Adam. Exodus 34. Exodus 34. Exodus 34. And we'll look together in verse 1. Exodus 34. And the Lord said unto Moses, You, the two tables of stone, like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount. Tables of stone, like unto the first, and Moses rose up early in the morning, and went up unto Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud, and stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. If you want to know how God defines himself, this is how God defines himself. This is the Lord speaking to Moses, talking about himself. And he says, Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children, unto the third and to the fourth generation, and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people, and part in our iniquity and our sin. Take us for thine inheritance. God, bless the scripture now to our hearts, and pray that you'd minister to us. And Lord, give us understanding, and help us to apply what we hear. Help me to be a proper teacher, educator, preacher. For your honor and glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord makes a covenant, verse 10, before all the people. And he said, I'll do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord. For it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. And God goes and tells them to take heed and how they need to be diligent, pay attention to the commandment. Verse I want to key on is verse 7, where he says, Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, and transgression, and sin, that will by no means clear the guilty. There's something, when we talk about and I told you earlier, we'd be talking about forgiveness. It's been a, uh, quite a, a while that people have been discussing the nature of salvation between Old Testament believers and New Testament believers. And, uh, you know, Hyper-dispensationalist says it's by grace alone through faith alone. And it's always been like that. But the Bible tells us that in the Old Testament there was responsibility on the behalf of the individual to not just observe the law but to obey it. And when they brought an offering, they had to take the lamb and the owner caught the blood, and then went and did the application of the blood. 
But one thing I can assure you is that the Bible says God will in no wise clear the guilty. And so when we talk about clearing the guilty, we think about a word like atonement. And when we talk about atonement, in the Old Testament, the word Hebrew means to cover, right? In the New Testament, it has to do with release or forgiveness. Now, here's what you got to understand. People were saved in the Old Testament, but they had a different ministry with the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, people got saved. And the Spirit would come upon them, but the Spirit could also leave them. So, for instance, you remember the one we use all the time is Samson, right? Samson wist not that the Spirit had departed. He thought, just like at other times, he would just break the rope or break the chains. But he didn't realize the Spirit had gone. So, all I'm trying to say is that the salvation in the Old Testament is different than the New Testament. But it all goes through right here. People in the Old Testament had a covering for their sins until the blood was shed at Calvary. So that's why we've said before that people look forward in the Old Testament. Their atonement. How do you know that? Hebrews 11 gives you a list of some of the people in the Old Testament that it says they died in faith. In faith to what? In faith to reverencing the revealed Word of God and, and obeying it. Now, this is where everybody's sins get cleared. This is where sin is paid for, right here at Calvary. And so, this evening we're talking about forgiveness, and we're going to talk about a few different types of forgiveness as taught in the Bible. And the first is a... Judicial forgiveness. The word forgive literally means to release. That means someone is in debt and somebody's holding the note on the debt. From the Garden of Eden, we are all indebted to the Lord. He's holding the note. That's the payment. Right? How many of us have a mortgage? Or rent? <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if the landlord or the bank sent you and me a notice tomorrow and said, Oh, by the way, as long as you live here, you never have to worry about paying rent or your mortgage. It's been paid for. Say, well, they already have that. It's called welfare. But somebody's still paying for that. <laughs> the point is simple. That the sin, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When we talk about forgiveness, this is a divine release. done by God and it is offered or effective with the individual believer. This is a judicial forgiveness. The instant you get saved, the instant you got born again, there was a judicial forgiveness. In Ephesians 1.7 and Colossians 1.14, the Bible says the following, 
For whom, for, I'm sorry, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Colossians says, even the forgiveness of sin through Calvary. Remember, this is where God, God's eyes are on the cross. This is where you and every person has to get to Calvary in order to be born again. And once we are saved, there is a judicial declaration that our sins are completely released from our heavenly account. Now, some say, yeah, but if that's true, then it leads to lawlessness. It, it leads to people now being able to do whatever they want to do, and that's not true. We'll talk about that in a moment. Judicial forgiveness occurs only through the blood. 1 John 2, 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so the Lord, Jesus Christ, unlike what the Calvinist teaches, he didn't just shed his blood for the elect or shed his blood for... Um, uh, what's the word, uh, to the, uh, 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 the limited, limited number, or thing about limited atonement. You know, there's not a limited number for which the blood of Christ was shed. It says he shed his blood for the sins of the, all those in the world. So the blood, not one drop of blood is in danger of being shed if just one person ever got saved. That's where the Calvinist blows it. It would have cost Jesus Christ the same thing to die for one or a billion. That blood still had to get shed. And since he shed it, he does not hoard it. He will not limit its atoning ability. He offers it to anyone who will come to Christ for salvation. So there's a judicial forgiveness. And when we talk about this, we talk about such words like salvation, justification. These are all what we call the great vocabulary of the doctrine of salvation. Uh, reconciliation. Reconciliation. Substitution. There are several words that are involved in this. Uh, let me see. What am I missing? Salvation, justification, reconciliation, substitution. Um, let me see. Did I write anything down? Oh, remission. Regeneration. These are all words or actions that occur in the scripture that have to do with this great judicial act of God as the divine judge of the universe. He who created it is the only one worthy of being the judge of it. So when a person accepts Christ as their savior and goes to the cross, then all of these things happen. Another one is adoption. The Calvinist even gets that wrong. The Calvinist says that God adopts and then justifies. No, the scripture teaches that God justifies, then he adopts. And so these are important words. What is save themselves? That's you and I. That's salvation. What is justification? That means that as the divine Decreer, as the divine judge, he has accepted the penalty being paid by someone else and the guilty party is justified. You know what that means? 
declared not guilty. You are not guilty in the eyes of God. You've been justified. Not saying there wasn't enough evidence to convict. There was. But you've been declared or found not guilty. And then how about reconciliation? This is what we talk about. This is what happened in the Garden of Eden. When God and Adam were in fellowship together, Adam turned his back on God when he sinned. God had no choice but to now turn his back on Adam because sin separated them. And then when God took the lamb and slew it, God turned back to Adam, but only turned to Adam through the shedding of innocent blood and then allowed Adam to turn back to him. And that's when he received the coats of skins. But it was only through the blood. So now every person who's ever been born has an individual responsibility to turn to God through the blood. But not through the Lamb of the Garden of Eden, through the Lamb of God that we talked about this morning in John chapter 1. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. And so we've been reconciled to God. Substitution. What happened that day when the Jews cried out, Release unto us Barabbas. Barabbas was guilty. Jesus innocent. How do you know? Pilate said, I find no fault in him. Jesus became the substitution of a cold-blooded murderer. And you know what? As soon as you come to the cross, when you come to Calvary, he becomes your substitute. God says you're guilty and you deserve everything you got coming to you. And then Jesus says, how about if I take his place? How about if I take her place? He says, okay, you've got a substitute for yourself. Go ahead and go. Substitution. Remission. This is the only word that doesn't add anything to us. It removes something. Our sins are remitted. Our sins are taken away. Our sins are divinely released from us. Regeneration. That means that you've been actually born again, regene, regenerated. Not by corruptible seed, but by incorruptible. Regeneration of the believer. And then adoption. This is another legal act that takes place the second you get saved, where God adopts you into his family. Now, as the adopted son, we get to call him Abba, Daddy. He's now your daddy. The Jews didn't understand that. They couldn't comprehend it. So now you and I get to call him Daddy God. So there's a judicial forgiveness that can happen only through Calvary. Secondly, there's a national forgiveness. This is specific to Israel. And if you don't have to turn there, but in Daniel 9, it talks about the three or four things that God is going to accomplish in the 70th week, which is the tribulation period. And one of the things is the end of sins. God's, gonna, God's going to complete the 70 weeks, the 490 years. There is a national forgiveness. Thirdly, there's a parental forgiveness. What is that? 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Roman Catholics use that for the need to confess. Go to confession. If we confess our sins, it's not talking about going to God through a man, a priest. 
This is necessary for fellowship. If you remember, this is relationship. This is fellowship. So, you're saved and you can't lose it. Does that mean you're allowed to go and do whatever you want? Nope. Why? It affects your fellowship. The relationship can never be changed. But the fellowship, now that's a whole other story. This is what you and I are commanded to do when the Bible commands us to walk in the Spirit. Or, 1 John, walk in the light. It, well, let's turn there. 1 John, if you will. First John chapter 1. First John chapter that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him. Right? It's not talking about relationship. It's talking about fellowship. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, what does it make us? It makes us liars. We lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, even as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, Cleanses, cleanseth us from all sin. So here's the reality of it, brethren. And you don't have to turn there, but every the first Sunday of every month when we have the Lord's Supper and we go to 1 Corinthians 11, what does verse 28 tell us to do? Verse 28 says, let him, but let a man examine himself. You see, through judicial release. This is a once for all declaration in heaven for eternity. This is necessary to maintain our fellowship with our daddy while we're still on earth in this house and vessel. Because I still have a sin nature tied to this body. And that sin nature is, gives me a lot of problems. Does it give you problems? Gives me problems. Gives me a lot of problems. And so just because I'm saved, does it give me the right to do whatever I want to do? Go wherever I say whatever I want to say? Be whatever I want to be? Uh-uh. It greatly affects my fellowship to the point that God says, but let a man examine himself. Because if you partake of the elements unworthily, you eat and drink what? Damnation, not hell, but you're condemning yourself. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many... Listen, as your heavenly Father, because I love you, I'm not going to be an absentee dad. <laughs> I'm going to love you as a father is to love a child. Now that brings us over to the book of Hebrews where it talks about the chastening of the Lord. Now it's not pleasant when we get chastened, but it's necessary. Why is it necessary? To let us know that God loves us and cares about us. You and I see parents, they don't pay their children any mind at all. They let them do whatever they want to do. And you know what we say? That's terrible parenting. That's horrific parenting. Children need guidance. Children need direction. Children need boundaries. Children need to be taught. Why? Because foolishness is bound in their heart. And left to their own devices, they will leave, they will leave, lead their mother, leave their mother 
to shame, cause their mother to be in shame. And daddy also. God says, you do with your children as you will, but I'm not that kind of a dad. You and I are going to have to maintain fellowship. That's why you better walk in the light. Now, well, what happens if I mess up? Confess it. Confess it and forsake it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, what happens is some Christians go and make some mistakes and then the devil says, you see, God will never accept you. The pastor will never accept you. The church will never accept you. And the devil will lie to you and lie to you and lie to you just to get you out on an island all by yourself. Don't believe that lie. Confession. 1 John 1, 9 is in the Bible so that we can maintain good, necessary fellowship with our daddy. And then there's a fourth kind of forgiveness. And this fourth kind, well, Luke 17, if you turn there. Luke chapter 17. Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. Now I will say this. It is possible to limit offenses. You know how you limit offenses? You don't wear your heart on your sleeve. Don't become super sensitive. I'll throw this in there for safekeeping. Some of the most sarcastic people I've ever met only add insult to injury when they are also the most sensitive people. You can't walk in and start throwing verbal jabs at somebody and then as soon as they jab back, you go, oh, how dare you? Grow up. That's terrible. That's immature. That's unacceptable. He said, listen, offenses are going to come. Somebody's going to say something. Somebody's going to do something. This is not heaven yet. This is still, is, this isn't the sweet by and by. It's the nasty now and now. And we live among people that are often insensitive. And if you're hypersensitive, super sensitive, you're going to be getting offended every time you turn around. It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. God holds us accountable. You realize that, right? We need to be careful what we say. We need to be careful how we say it. I sincerely try not to offend people. I mean that, honestly. I really do. I, I try never to offend people. I'll go out of my way to ask forgiveness. Because he said, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Now, do you know, if you look, about, look at what we were saying this morning about taste and see that the Lord is good, and I said there are some Christians that do nothing more than leave a bad taste in other people's palate. I think about when uh, my wife and I were dating she knows the story. Well, as soon as I start to tell it, she's going to smirk. Her aunt lived in Jersey. We lived in the city. 
and we would go to her aunt's house on maybe 4th of July or Labor Day for a picnic. And her aunt's neighbor, who I won't say the name, made the most visually breathtaking desserts you've ever seen in all your life. But as soon as they served them, it was like, <laughs> it was bad. I don't know. You, you know how hard you have to try to make something look that good and have it taste that bad? Attractive, you try and make something appear on the outside, the taste lingers in your testimony. And so, you know why I say, and I learned this, one of the first things I learned as a young Christian, there's a lot of things I can do, especially, I'm saved 40 years now. There are places I can go that I don't. There are things I can do that I don't. But you know why I don't? I don't want to offend anybody. When I first got saved, this is God's, God's honest truth. When I first got saved, my brother-in-law was a shift manager at the Golden Nugget. And once a month, I'd take a ride down and I'd get a comp. This is back in the late 70s, early 80s. I get a $200 comp. And I'd drink cocktail and... I mean, I'd take a group of friends. We were juniors in high school, seniors in high school. I had a beard from when I was nine. No, I'm kidding. But even though you got carded, we got in. And we would go and, I mean, we'd eat like kings and queens. But then I got saved. And the guy that led me to the Lord, I said, hey, why don't you come? I'll take you to, to the casino. He said, oh, no, thank you. And I remember trying to press the issue. And he said, no, I, I don't go to those places. And you don't think I learned how to loophole? You're not, I'm not gambling. We're not even going in the casino. I found a hundred ways to present that. And he said, no, you know why I don't go to places like that? He said, because my brother-in-law got saved year and a half ago, and he, for many years of his life, was an alcoholic. He said, there are places I don't go because I don't ever want to be a stumbling block to him. Now, this would be a great time to pull out a Bible study on being a stumbling block to other people. When's the last time you heard a really good, hard Bible sermon on being a stumbling block to younger people. You notice how influential older siblings are to younger siblings, right? You don't think you have to answer to God for that? You're getting awfully serious. Woe to him from whom the offense has come. I'm 57, say 40 years. There are places I can go now. But you know why I don't? Because now I got Joey Billups who got saved a year ago. And I got to make sure I'm never a stumbling block to him. Somebody, ah, what do you mean, ah? He's a brother in Christ. Am I my brother's keeper? Yeah, in some ways I am, yeah. Absolutely. And I know that kind of Christianity isn't. But let me get to the, let me cut to the chase. Look at verse 3. It says, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostles said unto him, unto the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root 
and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. In a later time, Simon Peter will ask him, so okay, okay, so you're saying I, I'm to forgive my brother seven times? And he says, no, seven times 70. That's New Testament, where the Lord says, if thy brother offend thee, rebuke him. <laughs> and if he asks forgiveness, forgive him. Now, just to be clear, I don't believe God wants any of his children to be doormats. You shouldn't let anybody walk all over you. You shouldn't let anybody abuse you. But do you know what is often the worst kind of abuse that people take, both in life and in the Christian realm? Unforgiveness. That word right there, release. You hold malice against somebody. You know what you're holding on to? You're holding on to a fishing line that has you hooked. You don't see it, but you're hooked. And all that person has to do that you're angry at and you won't forgive and you hold malice toward, they can reel you in whenever they want. And they can control you. They can move you in the water. And they can reel you in. Or they can give you a line and let you go to think you're okay. Then all of a sudden, bang, they'll pull you and reel you in again. And I know people, Christians, that are so beaten down because of unforgiveness. That's why he said, forgive quickly. Do it immediately. Release it. Don't hold on to it. No one has the right to control you or affect you. But God. And the reason I say that is because marriages are in trouble because of unforgiveness. Relationships between parents and children are in trouble because of unforgiveness. Relationships between brothers and sisters are in trouble because of unforgiveness. Relationships between pastors and former church members are in trouble because of unforgiveness. As much as is possible, you need to do some serious introspection. And whatever you're holding on to, do yourself the greatest favor you could ever do for yourself and get the hook out of your soul and release it. You know what that looks like? Whoever that person or those people are, when they reel, you know, Ed's a fisherman, you know the difference when a fish is on and a fish isn't, right? You definitely know the difference. Once you release it, now you have freedom. You now have peace. You don't wake up with it on your mind every morning. You know what I'm talking about. Because there are some people, man, that you're just... You'll, and, and maybe it's a sermon like this that just dusts up some stuff. And the Holy Spirit says, you know, you're still holding on to that. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, and I'll close with this. The person you won't forgive is you. Now, the world says you need to learn to love yourself. No, you need to learn to forgive yourself. <laughs> Loving yourself is narcissism. Forgiving yourself is freedom. There's a difference. Maybe, and this one is probably the hardest,
to deal with. Some people are actually angry with God. How could you let this happen to me? How could you let this happen to somebody I love? How can you let this happen to a child? How can you let this happen to my... You, you need to release that. I mean, sincerely, you need to release that. Because it'll take you under. The person you want to be mad at is not God. <laughs> Some of the others I can help you deal with, but if you're angry at God, I got to tell you, you need to release that one. Because you need him a whole lot more than he needs you. And trust me, when we get to eternity and we ask him why, he's going to say, okay, here's the reason. And then we're going to, you're going to feel like a fool because you're going to say, okay, yeah, I see. I get it. Maybe you're not getting it down here. You'll get it up there. Believe me, I need to remind myself of that too. So forgiveness, very, very, very powerful necessity in the life of the believer. There's judicial forgiveness, thank God for it. It's the only way we get saved. There's national forgiveness. That's why we see everything moving, setting up the coming Antichrist. God's not done with the Jew. He's still very much interested in them. Parental forgiveness. This is what main, allows us to maintain fellowship with our, our daddy, our heavenly daddy. You get out of fellowship with God, you get so terribly backslidden. That's a bad place to be. And then personal forgiveness. Why? This will ruin a family. It'll ruin a marriage. It'll ruin a church. It'll ruin a workplace. This will ruin anything. Say it. Why? Because that's what it means. Release. God, thank you for the time we've had in the Word of God. Pray you would have used the Bible study for your honor and glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.